Okay, I'm getting the word. We just get started here. It's all uh, it's all quiet. Someone could give me a thumbs up. And let me know that we're uh, or maybe chat me. Let me know you can can hear me. We can get get moving here. We've got sound. Okay, it's uh, it's wonderful, and we're getting closer to uh, a situation where we can meet in person. <laughs> so it's wonderful to be involved today, and I'm uh, extremely grateful for the invitation. And it's been a great set of sessions this morning, and we've appreciated everything that's uh, been shared so far. So I hope that I can add to what's already been uh, communicated today and that you can have some, some takeaways. So welcome all of you. Thank you to the Utah Manufacturers Association for, uh, and for the others who have participated uh, today. So the question I would pose to this group is, if you could get absolute truth from one of your coworkers uh, or the people you work with or your employees and ask them what they truly feel, how they truly feel about you with no risk of repercussion, no anxiety, what would they say? And that's kind of a scary thought, right? So as we know, and thank you, Robert, and I see you're on this call. Uh, we are in a really weird situation. In fact, um, one of the reasons they've asked me to come speak today is because of our company's experience to be on Undercover Boss, and we're going to get to that. Uh, I was listening to NPR uh, just three days ago, and they mentioned the survey, and I found it. Nearly one out of three of your employees are currently looking for a new job. That's freaky, right? And I've asked, I think it's McKinley can, can uh, chat this reference for this, this Grant Thornton study. 51% of your employees right now, according to the survey, it was 5,000 uh, sample size, would take a new opportunity if they had it. And 54% say that my employer really understands my needs, which means half of your people that work for you don't feel that you really understand them and know them. And that's why I think this, this topic might be interesting and why the question uh, posed to, to might, might be intriguing. So today I'll go through a brief introduction and I tell you a little about our business. Just I want to give you context. And part of the context is why in the world would Undercover Boss have interest in a, in a, a small Utah company <laughs> and, and talk about my experience in Undercover Boss and then perhaps uh, talk about some of the lessons we've learned since that we filmed and since that aired on, on CBS some years ago. I introduce you first to my parents. This is Tom and Dwan Young. You'd love them. They're very cordial, nice, generous people. Uh, my father here, this is our 100-year party. We actually invited Robert Spenlove, who's on the, the call here, to, to be at our party. So, Robert, this will look familiar to you. Uh, this was our 100-year celebration just before COVID hit, COVID hit in, in 2020. And I put 80 years above my head, not because my father is 80 years old. It's because he's been an employee for 80 years. If you can believe it, he just turned 94. Yes, child labor laws. He just missed World War II. He was just, I just turned 18 as the war ended. Uh, here is the, my father is the second generation of our company. Uh, the third generation is shown here, including my two brothers and my brother-in-law. And uh, we have, we are announcing and involving our fourth generation in key leadership for our company. And Ryan Young, just this past year was named president and CEO of Yesco. And uh, we, uh, we are all working together as, as a family business. We have had quite a history in signs. My grandfather here on the left was an immigrant at age 15. He came to, to Ogden of all places. His, his father was a coal miner turned railroad worker. I think it's obvious for all of us in Utah why he would be in Ogden if he worked on the railroad. And he just quit school. He loved to draw. There, is, there, there he is, uh, oil painting. And he started this little business with a loan from his father. And uh, it just grew from there. Uh, and behind me, maybe you see the glass, is a replica of the truck that you see in this black and white photo. Uh, it took him four years to save up enough money to buy his first truck, Model T, 1924, and uh, just founded this business in Ogden, Utah. His first breakthrough project in Ogden was this rooftop sign for the Eccles family for Security Bank. And he had pretty dramatic success through the 1920s, which were great years. Uh, the Depression came, and uh, he opened a small branch and made it through the Depression, opened a small branch in Salt Lake City, and then later in the 30s, uh, he decided to move the operation down from Ogden, kept an office there, but moved the main office here to Salt Lake City on 300 West. 
This is the location where the Target store is on 3rd West and about 12th South. And we were there for 60 years. So we built signs, some of which these names you'll recognize and know. Uh, those of you that are older on the call will recognize uh, some of these signs that are, that are long gone, perhaps, but still uh, remain a big part of our history and our culture, including a lot of signs in Las Vegas. Uh, the Boulder Club was uh, another, again, breakthrough sign for us. And my father, uh, my grandfather designed and our company built some of uh, the iconic signs, which, which still represent a lot of what Las Vegas is. And uh, our history is deep. I mean, these signs, we've been maintaining the Maddox sign for years. I think we all know the bowling pin. This is its uh, third or fourth renovation. We're very happy that it's uh, still there. And we do signs of all sizes and all types. So you think about as manufacturers, you know, a lot of us are custom manufacturing, uh, trying to get some economies and efficiencies. We don't do a very good job of not being custom. In fact, we focus on it. And so, as I, as we would say, uh, even our largest customers need small signs. And the university is a great example where we're doing all the interior uh, uh, plaques and and even the even the very small ones. Uh, in fact, Dean Randall <clears throat> on uh, just before the, the big event there at the business school talks about how he had a name change above uh, one of the rooms it had to happen just on a tight turn. And, you know, we, we had to make that happen after, you know, all of the months and months of efforts to get that identified. We do big, these large screens, including the one on the south side of uh, the University of Utah field. And perhaps you recognize some of these other signs around, around town. Uh, we've been watching, you've been watching our, our giant screens inside the Vivint Center for all these years. That system has performed great and we, we, it really transforms the experience. So we have a lot of requests for customers uh, to build these custom sized screens are getting much uh, higher resolution, including this recent installation in Murray for Security National. And of course, I think all of us know Southtown Mall, and we still build some of the largest signs in the world in, uh, in Las Vegas, Caesars, Wynn, New York, Aria. I'm just, I'm trying to throw all these at you pretty quick just to give you a feel and a sense that our work product, the stuff we build is very unique, and we just never build it twice. And with that comes a lot of challenges in terms of culture, in terms of workforce, which is our main, main topic today. You know, how do we find, keep and retain good employees? And when we're building these large projects with all of the potential of making errors, and we just, just heard earlier between Logan and, and Andy with Motivosity, how, how you can make an error and, and still save your career. Well, if we misspell something in our business and the letters are 12 feet tall, and I'm not saying we've, Yes, we have, in fact, misspelled and transposed letters in the past. So just to give you a sense of our work product, uh, this just went up in Phoenix. This is a three millimeter unit. You really cannot tell it's, it's not a TV. It's an LED screen uh, for Gila River just south of Phoenix and Chandler. A couple of signs in, in LA, mall, retail, Beverly Center. Uh, this is the largest, tallest building in LA, the UOE Sky, Sky Space. And we built the, the main sign there, large screens back at Staples Center for Circa. And then uh, some of the stuff we have in, in works is, is also downtown in LA at Oceanwide. This is a, a large, huge new screen going in. Anyway, we, our office is in Las Vegas, uh, our corporate office in Salt Lake City, uh, our, our flagship operation here in Salt Lake. And about two thirds of our employees are laborers, meaning they're hourly paid, they're tradespeople, and they're making, they're manufacturing metal, they're welding, they're cutting, they're painting, they're wiring, they're fabricating, they're assembling, they're installing. Uh, so we have a, a, a large percentage of our workforce uh, is blue collar. We build custom signs. We have a billboard business. We're often recognized as only being a billboard business, but it's only about 10% of our revenue. <laughs> and we do, of course, the LED electronics. We have a financing business for our customers who need help. And then we do, we have a service repair business that's, um, that's extensive. And uh, in fact, we've taken that model and we franchised it. So in the West, we're operating 40 locations in the West, which are corporate owned locations. And then we have 77 offices open that are franchise service offices. They aren't custom sign shops. Strangely, the franchise operators, many of them are sign companies operating under their sign company name and have purchased a Yesco franchise. And so they're running a set of trucks branded Yesco alongside with, with, their, uh, with their own brand. 
Uh, so if that, if that makes any sense. So we're at 117 locations. We have 948 employees, uh, corporate franchise, about 700. We're, we're very proud of that just because our franchise business is only a decade old and we've added uh, nearly 700 people. So that's to give you a sense of our population. That favors an undercover boss because there's a higher chance you can find an employee who doesn't know who the boss is if you, you catch my drift. Aside from all the big signs we build, our bread and butter is just the one stops, retail, uh, local restaurants, that kind of thing. We love that work. And so we, we love building small signs. So let's get in undercover and we'll have time for question answers at the end too. So you say, you know, how in the world? Well, let me tell you how we think it happened. They never tipped their hand and told us, but my phone rang. They called me on the phone and said, hey, have you ever heard of the show? I said, well, yeah, I saw, <laughs> I saw you know, yes, I saw Greg Miller on Undercover Boss, and I'd seen a series of, of episodes, and I, you know, and they said, well, are you interested to talk to us? And I said, well, yes. They said, we'll sign this non-disclosure because you can't really tell anybody. And what had happened, we had had a little short, little snip, small little three-minute thing with the Neon Museum in Las Vegas on the Today Show. And so you say, well, wait a minute, CBS does Undercover Boss and say, okay, well, someone in CBS may have been watching the Today Show. Could be. The other thing, this is Erica Hill. She's, she's back at CNN now. She was weekend anchor at, uh, at the time at, at CBS, uh, excuse me, at NBC Today Show when she came out to, to interview us. We were also featured on this really fun science series called How We Got to Now that was a joint BBC and PBS series. And we were featured alongside with Thomas Edison in the light episode. So they went from the light bulb, then they went to neon and they talked about Thomas Edison. They talked about Thomas Young, which for us was really, really fun. So we're thinking maybe they may have seen us in that media. Well, this wasn't just, okay, we're coming out to film you. It literally took months of time. They had all these questions. They actually sent a film crew out to kind of film who we were, who I was, uh, my brothers who are on the side wings here, neither of them, both of them refused to do this. So they, we had kind of all agreed and they just backed out chickens uh, that if we're going to do it, that, that would be something I would do. And after all that, we got this huge giant agreement and our attorney said, don't sign it because they, CBS doesn't want anything to get in the way of broadcasting. And if we have any edit rights or anything to say, or if we, if we have an issue with any, any content at all, they can't go to air and it gets, it gets stuck in an injunction. So we waive, you know, we waived every single one of our rights. And from a legal perspective, it was a bit of a gamble and not something really our attorney would have recommended we, we sign. Uh, so we ended up signing, however, um, not every one of our team was in favor of it, but um, the deal was with Undercover Boss that they would pay for, CBS would pay for all of the production and all the development of the episode, but many of you have seen an episode and understand uh, that there are gifts. They, the idea is they find they find an employee in need and say they, because I didn't pick them, they did. And at the end of the episode, the company does something generous to them to try to help them along. So all that gift money was money that we would have to agree to 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 do. And they had a, a minimum amount that they asked us to 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 do. So you know, at the time we were pretty. It's a different market today, labor market. We thought, you know, we're actually doing okay. We've got de decent benefits, our compensation. We, you know, we subscribe to um, to the IBM Connexa, which kind of tells us where uh, pay rates ought to be. We kind of feel like we're a family business. We have a good feeling. We do service awards, incentive awards. We're members of the employer council. You know, we're just kind of building ourselves up say you know we're you know if how could we do much wrong we have an employee assistance program i'm sure that our employees are going to be happy and just say nothing but nice things about us on tv uh, you know surprise surprise we you know we we work with oc tanner and doing service awards for our employees and all been great things our branding and marketing's you know pretty decent relative to our a lot of our competitors and we have fairly good differentiation and geographic growth, and we're doing fairly well in our dashboarding and accountability systems. We have a great uh, web group, uh, Mighty Clever, and, and uh, we subscribe to Tableau, which is a great visualization package. And we've added NetSuite to our, uh, as our ERP. So, you know, we feel all that's pretty robust. And we started thinking, okay, well, okay, we have remote 
there are people spread out everywhere, right? We have a very custom product we're building with a lot of entanglements, colors, placement, size, quantities. It's all just, you know, it's very, very complicated. It's uneven workflow. You know, we are, it's, it's hit and miss. Our billboard business is very steady. Uh, but our manufacturing business is just, it's feast and famine, you know, from one year to the next. Very tight timeline for us. A customer will spend uh, two years building a building and give us three weeks to get our signs done. Well, in fact, the Vivid Center, we had, I think, a little less than four months to put up 10,000 square feet of screen amid a concert schedule. And you know, we were four months in contract negotiation, and we had a little less time to, to actually put all that up. And so a high probability of error, there's not a lot of repetitive work. And of course there's risks, there's electricity, there's heights, there's all that kind of thing. So, but we went in thinking, okay, we're gonna be okay. You know, I'm sure we'll be fine because our employees love us. I'm sure they'll, they'll, they'll not say anything bad about us at all, I'm sure. But you all understand the idea of undercover bosses, let's find out the real story. Well, it started with a disguise. They told me, don't cut your hair, they said, oh, I wish we had six months, but they got like three months. And my hair actually doesn't look that long, but I was at the time I was fairly short, short hair. Don't shave your beard and don't circulate. Don't go out to your offices. We don't want anybody to know you've changed your hairstyle and your, your facial hair thing because they wanted to, to surprise uh, the employees with, uh, you know, with someone they wouldn't recognize. So that, that was part of, the, part of the thing. And here, this is how I ended up. And I still get razzed about this. I, in fact, I got razzed about it. I had an employee's uh, son come in the office this morning and was giving me a hard time. They called it pink. We call it purple. Uh, they, you know, they, they kind of shaved me tight and then they did the faux hawk and then they they bleached it and they painted it purple and they did the goatee thing. They didn't pierce my ear, but they gave me an earring and a wild cosmic cat shirt. And off I went and they had worked. Annette is with our office. She's actually on this call. They had worked with Annette with, with my blinders on to set up interviews with employees under the guise of a completely different deal, not knowing it was undercover boss. And with Annette's help, they interviewed about 90 employees and found maybe five or six that they wanted to film. They planned on filming five. They ended up filming four and only three edited into the final episode. And they told me, as we film, we're only going to use a 40th of footage. So, you know, to go right through this, I went to Chicago. Uh, it was easy, easier for me. I had an assumed name, right? I was acting like I was someone I was not. Uh, I was dealing with this employee I'd never met before. This is a franchise operation. So I didn't have the fear of him recognizing me, but uh, the, they, they got me on this sign. This is just east of O'Hare Airport at a giant Hyatt Convention Center. The, the base of the sign is 90 feet off the, off the ground. And it's a caged ladder thing. <laughs> and it had been raining. So anyway, and I'm not good with heights. So I am, you know, by the time I get up there, I am seven cameras rolling. I don't, I've never met this guy. He's telling me what to do. I'm trying to remember that I'm not who I am. I'm like, don't say anything stupid. They, they said to me, if you don't want it on TV, don't, don't say it. And I'm like, okay, well, how do you not say it? Well, um, as I got done kind of filming with this, little did I know, they pulled this employee aside and they said, tell us the dirt, tell us everything they, we need to know. And then they told them, this is not going to err on what we're doing. We need you to tell us this because we need to do something else. I know that doesn't make much sense. And uh, there's some, some confidentiality with their, their tricks and how they, they do it, but they were masterful at it. They put two or three quarters in this guy and got him talking and they said, tell us more, tell us more, tell us more. And he you know, after a day of working and interviews that I never heard, he went on to say that he had had a fairly rough experience with the company. They worked him too long, too hard. Uh, he had lost his retirement in the in the, uh, the big recession, and he has a special needs brother, and he has a heart condition, and it's too long to call in a customer service. And I'm like, oh, great. This, uh, wow. Okay. So, it kind of you know took my breath away, and and uh, and we just learned some lessons. He needs training, poor support. He's overworked. He's tired, and these long-term health concerns. How's this going to go? And I'm like, okay, well, we're we're probably going to be okay. We we moved. We went to Las Vegas. I also wasn't too worried about uh, this employee who I did not know well, but I met Michael Gallette, 
And his heart-wrenching story was it, he lost his job, he lost his home in, in Michigan, he put everything in a van, uh, came to Las Vegas homeless, uh, without money in an apartment. Um, he was living on the street, he put his wife and his, his son, uh, Alex, in, in a homeless shelter. He was eating a, a dollar McDonald's sandwich every day, that's all he was eating, lost 70 pounds. His van was impounded, he couldn't get it out, and he was just living on the street. And then we hired him. And so as the story goes, he um, was living in basically a one bedroom apartment with three people. Zach sleeps on the floor next to the fridge. Um, you know, not the best of financial situations, but I got to know Michael a little better. I had not, I did not know him, had not known him well, and I met his son. And so lessons learned. He mentioned the fact that they had just laid a bunch of people off, which we weren't telling any of our supervisors were filming on TV. And so if, you know, there was no chance for me to say, hey, hold off, <laughs> you know, don't lay the people off till after the filming. You know, I'm in that quandary where they were, our, our managers in Las Vegas were just doing their thing. And then we showed up for filming under the, under the radar. And, and uh, I showed up all in costume. They snuck me in and out of van in these work centers. And so he said, you know, this, this whole thing with this layoff is horrible. Um, it's really been hard on me. And um, in the middle of that, he's, you know, he's had a lot of personal challenges. Then I, I met and, and worked with this giant Viking of a man. Um, Eric Byington's his name. Huge man. And uh, Eric was funny. He was probably the most likely to recognize me. But every time he looked at me, he didn't want to look at me. He looked, he looked, he right went to my face. He'd immediately look at my hair and then he would look away and kind of roll his eyes going, this guy's a, I think in filming, I think he, he, he thought of Oompa Loompas when he looked at me. He says, I can't understand why someone would choose this style. So he was not really looking at me that way because he knows my brother pretty well and theoretically could have recognized me. But after having worked with, uh, with Eric in, in paint, I was in a warehouse with Michael. I didn't mention that, but he had me do some painting and, and that kind of thing. Uh, he sat down and told me that he was in an, his, he was in, involved in an ATV accident with his two boys and one of his sons was killed some years ago. And he talked about this really challenging time when he went through this really these dark days and he finally got his life together uh, and was made a supervisor at Yesco. And he, with work and with the support of work, he's able to kind of get his, his world back together. But then he went on to say, hey, this, this company is, used to be very friendly and, and family oriented. And we used to have picnics. And he said, now it's just about the numbers. And it's just pretty much, you know, hard line, just get it done. And it, it's kind of, a, he kind of described kind of a heartless environment, which, you know, really kind of stopped me. We had one more employee we filmed with, and she, uh, it didn't edit in, it didn't end up in the, in the episode. She her, she went through 16 different things that were just horrible. Hates her supervisor, hates her former supervisor, hates her third supervisor, uh, made a recommendation. No one listened to her. And she just went on and on and on and on. How about how horrible experience was at, at working for us. And so they get all this edited. They get this all filmed. Excuse me. They get this all filmed. And the producer sits down with us and she's saying, did you hear what they said? <laughs> this is going on national TV. What are, you know, what are you going to do to make this right? These are pretty. And so I, at, at one point during filming, I thought to myself, and Annette, you were there with me. It's on the, on the call here. I thought, what if I just ran away? <laughs> what if I just left the hotel and just, you know, Recolored my hair and and I, I thought this is uh, you know we're are really up to the the uh, the team at CBS to decide how to portray this. So um, again, a few um, a few uh, lessons learned from from paint this grieving loss, the red tape, the feeling of family unity, and the celebrations recognition. So you know, cutting to the chase on lessons learned from undercover boss. And I'll, I'll come back to it at the end of my comments here today. Number one. I, at the end of it, I felt completely disconnected that these people had gone through so much. And I, not only was I not connected with their stories, but I was not connected with them. 
And yes, we have 1,700 employees and I can't take 1,700 employees out to lunch and spend two hours with them. I, I got that. I've got brothers, we have other family members, but are we connecting with our employees? Do they feel honored and represented? Do, do we know who they are and do we know the struggles they've been through? That's a really important thing for us, particularly today because the, the balance of power between between employees and companies now with the, with the job shortage is so is is so uh, challenging. So are are our teams connected to the overall goals? We, in response to this, did a survey and said, hey, do you know what the main goals are of the company? Uh, this was back in 2018. And we thought, you know, we're probably doing pretty well. Uh, but we had met and talked to and engaged with the Franklin Covey people and have put in place four disciplines. So one of the things we'll chat out, uh, chat this out uh, right away is this four disciplines of execution is a platform by which our teams, we have 147 teams meeting every week. It's a huddle. They all, uh, we have the big goal for the company and they each set their own goals as a team that support the big goals. Then they make a commitment every week to do something to try to move the needle for the goal. And, you know, we could spend three hours, four hours, five hours just on this, but we've not only adopted the principle, uh, Franklin Covey, and this sounds like a commercial, it's not, but we tried to run it ourselves with our systems and Google, you know, Google Sheets and folder, shared folders and, and met, you know, like dashboarding, all that. And it, we eventually broke down, if you will, and we, now we have their system. So we can spin up all 147 teams and see who's winning and who's not winning. And so it's a, it's a great program. The idea is we're all doing our, we're all busy in our stuff every day, but let's take a little bit of time every week and focus on the most important. And for us, for this year, our goal is to have a meaningful, each of the executive team and my main wig, the wildly important goal team, we have, we're supposed to have a meaningful conversation, conversations, plural, with customers, employees, suppliers every single week. And we get point, we have points for that. So, and then we're graded on based on how well our team is doing to that end. And it brings the accountability and the peer pressure in that makes, make things go very well. The other thing that kind of came true, which we had gotten from our em, uh, employee assistance group, uh, Blomquist Hale, uh, particularly Brent Hale, who's the principal there is, uh, do we, do our employees have, do they know the vision and are they based on values? Do they, do they have a belief that they're in control of their destiny? We, we talked earlier in the day, they talked about how it's not just a job, it's a career ladder. Do I have control over my destiny? If I do A, can I get B? Will I be recognized? Will I be promoted because of, of what I do? And, and three, and maybe the most important, does someone really give a care about me at work? And realize, you know, Jeff Young can't shake the hand of every employee every day. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you in a minute, we get to it that whole idea of caring has really got to come from frontline supervisors and that's just got to happen. So I'd recommend the book build on, on values. You can write that down. We'll chat it out. Um, the, the, the idea and emphasis that uh, employees do a much better job of connecting on a value than they will the mission statement on the wall, which is great. The graphics are great. We need to be repetitive there, but they have to have the values that people really believe in their heart of heart. We have just begun. It's not, you know, it's barely, I can't, I don't have any great results, but we have a Yesco Cares. It was inspired by a Rotary Club. We're members of the Salt Lake Rotary Club and there's an acts of kindness committee and we fund acts of kindness and they find people in the community who need their car fixed and a new mattress purchased and, and all that kind of thing. So we, we've created a similar thing and where the employees do a payroll deduction it funds the 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 the, uh, the fund, and then we have employee advisory group who decides who receives requests and then decides where this money can be spent. And so we're very excited about this program because it puts puts our employees instead of like just the company donating money, um, even though that's you know really important. It's employees reaching out to employees, and it's employee run, employee managed, which is really nice. So another lesson learned from undercover. Are we leaning too heavily on certain individuals? Uh, most people, particularly through the pandemic, are very anxious. And uh, with cutbacks and all, our people are feeling more anxious than they ever have before. And we may be, it, it, you know, the pressure points may be real. Are we providing enough recognition to our employees? Do we really know our team members and what stories need to be told? 
So one of the things we, we landed on and tried to do, and I, I won't have enough time to go through all of this, is we've conducted a series of surveys to try to do our best to try to figure out how we found our employees and, and where they're coming from. So uh, in the three years prior to 2021, mind you, a lot of this was before a pandemic, we had hired a total of 718. And we first asked the question, where did you come from? And one of the things that came out of this survey was we had a lot of employee referrals, we had a lot of Indeed, and we had a lot of connections with the company that were just like friendship thing. So, um, and that could be family. So we have family and friends, as we would call it, and a lot of Indeed. So nearly seven out of our 10 hires, 700 people, nearly seven out of 10 of them either came from Indeed or someone they knew at the company. And we thought and think and might say, that indeed's a great a great thing, but friends and family is even better. And let me say say why why is because the retention for those with a connection with the family and employer referral is much much higher than Indeed. If you look down the list, the Indeed retention was only thirty seven percent, and our connection with the company uh, was you know closer to sixty. So I'm not saying abandon Indeed at all because we we still use it. Uh, most of our franchisees. Uh, it's probably their go-to, but if if you can have someone recommend, uh, if you can find an employee through existing connections, um, it's much more important and and much more, shall we say, valuable. This is the same data flipped upside down. So uh, you see that this is the the percentage loss. So indeed, sixty three percent Craigslist, sixty two percent lost. So six out of ten were gone. Uh, we asked a separate question: Why did you decide to take your job with Yesco? This isn't where you came from. It's like, well, what was it? And as you can see on the whole theme of, do we really know our employees? There are dozens of reasons why. Uh, and I had to you know, assemble these, these main areas, but our reputation surprised me. I, I, I was not sure or didn't anticipate that that would be something that would matter, but it does. And I think it matters more now than it did 20 years ago. And you can see the other, the other topics here, opportunity rehire. So be nice to your employees as they leave because they may come back to be your best employees. Uh, and you can see schedules high on the list, which is a, a much bigger issue now than it was two years ago. So this is that list. Um, why have you chosen to stay? Uh, team, recognition, people, environment, and pay. Look, pay is way down the list. So, and I'll show you in a minute, a more recent survey we've done uh, shows pay much higher on the list. So pay has become a more dominant uh, factor. So all of this, the reason I'm sharing all this is uh, we undercover showed us we don't really know our people the way we should. They, If you really got them in a room and if there was no repercussions, they would say a lot more than they're willing to say. Our most recent survey asked the question, would you recommend yes go to a, a family member or to a friend? And then from there, it's like, well, how can we improve your work experience? The bottom line from all this leadership communication processes is um, the top three don't involve pay. Got that. Leadership is the far the most common suggestion. And the lower the rating, the more likely leadership is mentioned as an area for improvement. So we broke this data up in, in, in terms of customer satisfaction, this idea of net promoter score or NPS. Um, in, in light of an NPS score for our employees, the idea is you have promoters and you have detractors. So you, you, know, you kind of say you cut it down the middle and say, OK, you've got the sample on the left who are really basically committed to the company and loyal and happy. And then you have the group that isn't so happy. And what we're saying is the employees that are less happy, they're less happy because of the leadership that's going on. And so that's that's really where, you know we have to get to work. So in this survey, different than the other two, benefits and culture and pay. Um, culture is right there, exactly what we're talking about. The benefits are higher on the list and pay is higher on the list than it has been. So there definitely has been a shift. And again, we have a much more, when you say polarized, we've got an interesting environment now where people are very, they're strong-minded on topics and issues now, more so than they've ever been. And they have a stronger voice, and it makes for a much, you know, we've, we filmed, it's been a series of years ago, you know, when we filmed Undercover, it's, a, it's, the environment's completely changed. 
And we know it's changed. Uh, you know, we read the news like and watch the news like everyone else does. And it makes for a very, very challenging environment. So I'll probably with that, I have a few lessons learned at the end I want to I want to cover, uh, but we'll maybe go to, to some question and answer. Um, and I'm not sure who will vocalize those. I was understanding that, uh, Megan. So this is uh, from Megan. Do you offer employees referral bonus if their referral is hired? We haven't, we've done a little bit of that, but not much as much as you think. I heard this morning on the radio, someone was offering, I think it was, where was it? It was a $5,000, oh, it was the prison. They're offering a $5,000 bonus. So we have not done that, but um, it's a great question. And what we're all gonna have to consider new mechanisms to try to get people um, to, to jump in and join our firm. Are there any other uh, online questions, Megan, that I missed here? Megan's got a hand up and I can hear you. Is there a question? You know? Jeff, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, go ahead. Okay, sorry. No, um, we I had another question texted in that was just wondering what your retention rate is currently, if you know? Yeah, of the largest sample we did of that 718, it was about half. So in three years, uh, in three years out of 718 people, we had about 340, some of them left over three years. So, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, I can't do that math specifically, you know, what our annual turnover rate is. What we tend to see is in some of our starting positions, the turnovers is way high in our patrolling for our service business, our patrolling people, the turnover there is 200 plus, you know, 250%. Our, our sheet metal people and our senior designers, not so much, you know, just depending on, but overall that, that large sample of 718, it was about half, a little less than half. Okay. I don't see any questions right now, so I will turn off my volume and um, see if any other come in or if you have any other comments. Yeah, let me just wrap up here. If there's no other questions, we can certainly get to it. Let me just go to the top of my screen here. Uh, bottom line, um, if you haven't had a chance to see our episode, uh, you know, very gracious of you to, to even watch. Um, we ended up uh, replenishing uh, our Chicago worker. Here he is, he came out to Salt Lake. We ended up replenishing his retirement uh, that he had lost. Eric Byington, we paid for his daughter's education. And we agreed with Eric that we would commemorate his son's life on his birthday every single year on our digital billboards. And that's been that's been kind of a heartwarming thing to remember Riley. So this is his son that passed away and we, we recognize him on his birthday. <clears throat> Michael Gallette, we gave him enough money functionally to move out of his apartment and, and buy a house. And so Michael's now living in a much better environment. He bought a car, uh, which is great because he was commuting to work on, on a bicycle. And, um, you know, there's a lot of lessons here that, that we can get to, but I'll finish with some quotes. Trust can emphasize more, means more than anything else. Uh, and Winston Churchill, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. And all you got to sit down and listen. That's a big one for us. Of course, find your voice, help other people find theirs. Eighth habit is a little less read than the seven habits is and recommend it. A great quote here by Simon Sinek. Um, you know, just the confident, just be quiet <laughs> while other people can talk. And then out of the, uh, out of the book, I uh, turn the ship around, uh, which we would talk, we'll have to talk about another time. This idea that you have got to give control to other people, perhaps. And he would say here that it's not about you controlling. It's about giving other people the opportunity to control what's happening in their world. And this, this book, which I'll recommend this turn the ship around. He is a a Navy uh, submarine captain who was assigned to a different submarine like two weeks before he was supposed to go to another one. He knew nothing about the submarine. He had spent a year studying the, the, the former. And what he says is that giving control to others and working through the anxiety of giving control to other people perhaps is your biggest challenge, your most enduring and powerful success. So I think I'll end on the David Marquet quote and recommend that book highly because it's really helped us through uh, trying to get to know our employees and, and giving them more power and authority. 
Jeff uh, Todd Bingham here with UMA. Thank you so much for for doing this. Uh, I I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation, and um, you know think you ought to probably institute Cosmic Cat T-shirts as part of Casual Fridays over at Yesco. But um, you know, thanks for. Uh, I think those of us on the call know how hard it is to make yourselves vulnerable like that as a as a business. You know that you're you're basically going in with this assumption that, that everything's great. And, and, you know, you work so hard as a leader to do that with your team. And, and then when you come back and you find that there are maybe some things that, that, you know, you didn't know about it, it's like you said, you kind of just want to curl up in a ball and, and, you know, or run away. It's, it's just easier, um, you know, to, to do that. But kudos to you guys for, for, you know, opening yourselves up, being vulnerable to that and then taking the next steps to talk about how is it that we that we change you know you guys are into your fourth generation you know that in and of itself is an amazing accomplishment as a family as a family business and uh, so I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation um, and uh, in fact I'm going to be contacting you because I've got some thoughts on something I may have to <laughs> bend your ear on a little bit but um, do we have any other any any other comments coming in, uh, other than that I was way too close to the mic there? Um, <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, here's one last question, maybe um, uh, for you, uh, Jeff. How's your team responded to the changes that you've made so far? I mean, you know, I, maybe it's too it's too soon to look, and we're we're still coming out of the pandemic. But in, any initial thoughts on how the teams responded? Yeah, I I don't see us in in uh, in any remarkable position at all. I mean, yes, we have a lot of long-term people deeply committed and we are struggling like everyone else is to keep the people we've got and to try to find people to, to, to fill the spots and, and to, you know, fill the void for us to, to move forward. So how have they taken to it? I, when, the, when it aired and I'll try to be brief, it created an immediate expectation. The company had to do something. And so that built-in expect because the employees have all seen it, right? And we show new employees, they see it and they go, oh, this is the kind of company they are. And boy, they're going to really step forward and help me too, not in terms of monetary, monetary gifts, but it, it's it not been nice, but having that, that expectation, it puts us in a unique position to, to really get out there and, and try to make a difference and, and on, on a whole new level. And I think What's happened because of Undercover Boss, I think our employees are more open-minded to the idea that we are trying to change and trying to improve. And I think that openness has, has given us a little bit of, uh, of tailwind and helped us down the path. And you, you've hit something uh, on the head today that we've spoken about in our board meetings and with other companies is that, you know, manufacturing companies where you're a one-off type of a thing or you're always changing, it's hard to create a culture um, sometimes, and uh, it might be really easy for, again, a tech company to create a climbing wall and uh, ping pong tables and, and all of those things. That can be a challenge in a manufacturing operation. Um, and so creating that culture of stickiness where your team members know what their value is and why do they want to continue to work for you is something that manufacturing companies are really looking at over the last number of years. And it gets exacerbated by what was been talked about today, which is under 2% unemployment. And, and again, it's an employee market right now where if they're not happy with what's going on in the culture and everything that's going on, they can look. Um, and, and so creating value and stickiness and all of those things is critical for, for manufacturing companies to really look at what is my culture and, and why, you know, what is my upside? Where am I going from here? And that doesn't even go into discussing the differences in, in generations. And, and Gen Z versus millennials versus, you know, uh, whatever the new generation is. Um, but, you know, how they look at how long do I work for a company? And, you know, some of us spend a long time with companies in today's generation sometimes doesn't do that, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a whole other dialogue for another day. But I, I appreciate your insight and everything you guys have you, you guys have done. So um, I have not seen the whole edition, but I'm going to go I'm going to go watch it if for nothing else for the purple pink hair and uh you know, you, you know, you walked right into that one, man. You know, those guys were, you know, they'll never let you live it down for those types of headshots. So, <laughs> so 
Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Thanks again for our wonderful event sponsors. Thanks for our breakout sessions. For everyone, we hope that you've truly enjoyed what we've seen today. We've recorded these again, and we'll be preparing to get them out to our membership so that you can uh, you can utilize them. In fact, I, I've got a couple of these presentations I want to share with some of my colleagues as well. So uh, thanks again to everybody. Jeff, thank you so much again for you guys for your continued um, support of the of the manufacturing industry. Congrats on, on you know, 100 years. We know you guys are one of the uh, companies in Utah that's continues to plow ahead and has done wonderful things. So thanks to everybody for being here today. Uh, continue to, uh, to drive the economy in Utah. Remember what Utah makes, makes Utah. Thanks everybody. Thank you.